In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, good morning. Good morning. Christ is in our midst. I love weddings. <laughs> Let me tell you, I love them. I, who doesn't love weddings, but I really love them. I love the romance. I love the love. I love the party. I love the couple. I love the whole thing. And I do premaritals right now individually with couples because not only do I have an opportunity to get to know them better that way, but also it's an opportunity for them to also have that intimacy with God through the priest. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today, especially because if you've been to a Greek Orthodox wedding or any kind of Orthodox wedding, you know how beautiful and ornate they are. And in fact, I love how we get married because the way we do it is exactly the way that is the mystery of Jesus Christ and His church. The couple calm down and they are standing in front of the altar. They are not looking into each other's eyes gazingly, okay, which is not bad, that's good. But the idea is they are already the love that's been poured into their hearts for one another and the vows that they've made for one another that they will love each other in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. All of that has already been understood by the time they come into the church. And as they're coming into the church, it's simply the priest wants to know, do they come freely? And have they vowed freely? But all of that is done ahead of time. But by the time we now come into church, in front of all of you, and especially in front of God, we know that their love is not enough. Whatever God has poured into their hearts for one another, whatever love is there to give to the other, is not enough. It's not. And that's why they know that it's God who really unites them and gives them what they need. So you see, marriage is the one thing that we were able to take out of the Garden of Eden. God gave it when everything was perfect. And in fact, while everything was perfect, he wanted and he said the not good was that Adam was alone. And he made them male and female to show that this is his true image. And that the love between a husband and wife is the greatest icon and image of God says St. John Chrysostom. Isn't that profound? And the way we understand it is that when Adam had to be put asleep because it was not good that he was alone and all the animals in all creation were not enough for him, so our careers are not enough for us, okay? When they, it says that in the Hebrew, when they translated it into the Greek, not only does it say sleep, but the Greek word is beautiful. Ecstasis. Ecstasis. And which is ecstasy. And the idea is, the understanding is that finally Adam has so much love that the love is pouring out to meet another. And that the love needs to meet and connect with the other. Isn't that beautiful? And that's God's love that has been poured into his heart. And it's not good that he has no one to share it with. And so God had gave then and he took from the rib of Adam. He didn't create Eve the same way. He didn't take from the dust of the earth to create Eve like he did with Adam. Why? So that we wouldn't think version 2.0 is better than version 1.0. <laughs> Because you know how it is with versions, right? And so especially we don't think that she is different, separate, somehow completely other, but bone of bone and flesh of flesh of original Adam so that man and woman are together. And even in the time of Judaism, before our Christian theology, you know what the Jews would reflect? Okay. So God took from the rib 
to show that Eve is one truly with Adam and they are of the same, why did God take the rib? Let's say, why not the head? One, one, one extreme. So that people would say that Eve is smarter than Adam. Cute, right? Why not the foot then? So that Adam never steps over Eve. Why the rib? Closest to the heart. To be in each other's hearts, standing next to each other as helpmates, equal before God. And so when you get married in this beautiful church, and by the way, if you have been chrismated in this church and have not gotten married in the church, you get a two-for-one deal, okay? And it's true. I didn't even know this. We never learned this at seminary, but the bishop made it very clear. If you're chrismated in this church, but were married before, the church would like to make sure that you get the fullness of grace and the blessing, and so he asks you, start planning your wedding. Again. <laughs> and you get married again. So if you've been chrismated here, and not married, you get another wedding. And the beautiful thing is you get to stand right here in front of this beautiful table, and it's the altar, the holy altar, and the river of grace that comes down really right in front of you. So you are literally in front of the altar of God. That is what marriage means to God. That you are in front of the altar of God. And that I'm on the other side as the priest. And the only time I come between you two and the altar of God is when God needs me to be His instrument. But until then, it's the couple and the intimacy of that altar. Isn't that amazing? Beautiful. Beautiful. And what are they doing as they're standing in front of this beautiful altar? What are they doing? They're standing there waiting for God to make them one. But He makes them one through the priest, through the church. And so the priest takes the rings. And the beautiful humility is that the couple don't take the rings and say it's my power, my covenant. We've already understood that. But now the couple is in a sense saying, hear the rings and they give them to God. And then God says to the priest, pick them up and be my hands and then show them how much I love them and I have given myself to them, especially in marriage. And so I take the rings just for the engagement and I say the servant of God, so-and-so, is betrothed to the handmaiden of the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three times. It's beautiful. Beautiful. And then the, from, then the handmaiden of the Lord to the... And so God is making them, bringing them together in the betrothal. Beautiful. It's exactly what we believe, right? Isn't that what you would want? Isn't that what we ask and pray for? Isn't that what we try to tell, especially our youth? Pray for your spouse. Pray that God give you the right spouse. Pray that God preserve. Now, and then finally when we get to the, the same thing, once I put on the ring, so it starts from God, they receive them. Notice, they don't do anything but put out their hands saying, we are open to you, God and your grace. We are here standing next to each other, loving each other, supporting each other, helpmates to each other, bone to bone, heart to heart with each other. Give us your grace. Make us one. And I, representing God, put the rings on the finger. And then, they have an Orthodox person representing the church. The church. Family and friends. To say, here am I also. And I will support you in this. And then she or he then exchanged the rings three times in honor of the Trinity. And that's what makes a successful marriage. Always starting from God, receiving God, 
and then letting people help you because you can't do it alone. Letting the church be there for you and to say, I'm here for you in your marriage. And the same thing, the same motif happens with the crowns. The crowns get put up. I, representing God, so God puts the crown. God crowns you husband and wife. And you're connected with each other now forever with the ribbon and the crowns that you receive in heaven, which is why we use crowns, because everything in the Bible talks about that you and I will receive crowns in heaven when we run the race to get the, to get the prize, when God crowns us with everything that we go through in life even the hard times especially. And so then he crowned, I crown, and again the people are there just receiving the crown. They don't put the crowns on themselves. They're not marrying themselves or creating. They receive marriage from God. And then again, once they're so happily married, again the kumbaro or kumbara, the sponsor, the orthodox, the person representing church, family, friends, says, here am I to support you in this. You're not alone. And so then they exchange them three times. That's a successful marriage. And then finally, when they drink the cup together, and then they, the priest grabs that gospel book, the good news, and he represents, again, I represent Jesus, which is very humbling, and as they're holding their hands, and as they're crowned husband and wife, and as they receive the cup, a common cup together, to go through life together, I grab their hand, and God is saying, I've got you. I've got you. And you take your first steps as husband and wife. And we go around that holy altar table, so that you know that no matter what, like the circle, may you never end, your relationship with one another, and may the center of your life be like that altar, holy, God, sitting in the center of your life. And those are your first steps as a married couple. Beautiful, isn't it? Today, Christ in the Gospel is calling out for a wedding feast, a wedding of all the wet things that he describes, and he describes his kingdom in so many ways, but I think the wedding is the most joyous. His first miracle? At a wedding. To say, I have come as your bridegroom, and I have given you marriage between each other, but before you can really understand marriage between one another as husband and wife, marry me. And it might sound strange, but God is saying, Marry me. And so the Father today in the Gospel is so excited because His Son has come now down into the earth and He has come to be with His people and He is saying uh, this beautiful parable, the Lord is saying this parable to try to open the ears and open the eyes. Do you see? The Father has called for a wedding feast for you and for me in His Son. I'm His Son and you're meant to be married to me. And this does not, is not too hard. It's not too hard for, the, for these people because it is all over the Old Testament. And so let me see if I can find you some of the quotes that I found to help you understand that they should have gotten this. In Hosea 2, 19 through 20, I will betroth you to me forever, says God. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion, I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In Isaiah 54, it says, For your Maker is your husband. Our Creator is our husband, the Bridegroom. The Lord Almighty is His name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. So there are many. And we've seen, and then in the New Testament too, we hear about in Ephesians from St. Paul how the mystery of marriage is like Christ and the church. And it is a beautiful mystery. But the only way that we can do marriage or we can do even our lives and our salvation 
because it's not all is that we marry Christ and here in this banquet the people made light of it who are those people that made light of it anybody know that Jesus is trying to talk about and help anybody the Jews that will refuse him the Jews that will not acknowledge him as their Messiah the Jews that cannot open up their heart but not only the Jews the Jews at that time but anyone who cannot and they made light of it and they went in all the different places they made excuses I have a business I have a farm and even in the Gospel of Luke, you hear even more excuses. I have oxen that I've just purchased. Or I even just got married. And they separate marriage from the wedding feast of the Lord. <coughs> they made light of it. And so the Lord, as we hear, is angry. And you could imagine, and, that, and he said that, he's angry, and it's, and it's why? Because it's a fulfillment of what will happen, and the Lord knows what will happen. And in Matthew, when he writes this, it's very clear. Because by, and I want to try to, uh, by 63 AD, the Jews would try again to go against the Roman Empire. And as they went against the Roman Empire, but there was a lot of fighting and killing and so forth and the Roman Empire was so upset Nero sent people out and then when Nero died it was taken over by Valerian and Titus his son and they all came into Jerusalem by 70 AD and the temple in Jerusalem and all of Jerusalem was destroyed and Josephus the historian says exactly what Jesus prophesied in the Gospels. Not one stone will be on top of another. We cannot make light of God, nor make light of His great invitation, which is a great invitation of great love that He's come to be married to us. And He's giving us a feast. The wedding banquet is how heaven is described. And the wedding banquet is also what the fathers say we do here. That's why I put the big icon of the mystical supper. Because you and I, every time we come here, are doing a very holy and blessed thing and a really profitable, practical thing. Once again, we're saying, I am married to you, God. There are a lot of people who say, in order to have a good marriage, every morning, wake up and say, I choose this person, and I choose to love this person. Well, when we come here, we're also saying, I choose you, God. Marry me. Like you married St. Catherine and gave her a ring. Marry me. And give me that wedding garment which you gave me when you baptized me and let that wedding garment be pure and clean. What is that wedding garment? It starts off with baptism. And it's so interesting then in this banquet, because we have this banquet, right? And those who made light of it, those who were invited, the Jews, because every, salvation was to come from the Jews, did not take it seriously. And so he says, and it predicts what they do. For the apostles go out into the whole world, right? They're going to the whole world. Because go out to all the nations. And who would receive them, especially the Greeks? Woohoo! Yay! Got a, a little pat on the back? All right. It's as far as we go. But the Greeks, thank God, were the, were the people in the thoroughfares and the highways and the byways. And guess what Luke says? Get the lame, <laughs> the blind, <laughs> the paralyzed, right? Get all that. That's what it says in Luke. Get everyone, the infirm, the sick. Do you know that the fathers say that the church is a hospital? One image of the church, yes, it's a wedding banquet, but it's also a hospital. That's why in today's Gospel, Matthew, it doesn't say about infirm and blind and all that. It just gives you blanket, 
bad and good. Wow. That makes me feel very good. <laughs> because I'm also very bad. And he says, get them, compel them to come in, the bad as well as the good. Isn't that amazing? You and I are all invited here to partake of his divine holy communion, his banquet, whatever we are. If we're willing to stand like a wedding couple in front of the altar, and just say, forgive me, crying out like that baby, repenting, crying out from the heart like that baby, <laughs> and to let him come in. So what's wrong with a guy without the wedding garment? And what do we take from here? St. John Chrysostom, St. Gregory the Diologist, Saint, who else did I read? I read a lot of different fathers. They're all in that book. <laughs> but I get going and I just can't stay on a paper. So St. Gregory the Diologist and St. John Chrysostom for sure. And I'll think of the other saint. But they all say it starts off with baptism. Okay? But it's to continue. The wedding garment, and I love this what Diologist said, and I'll see if I can find it to give you the exact words. But basically what he said is, we are here the good and the bad. Okay? Follow me. The good and the bad. The one without the wedding garment first snuck in in some way, but did not willingly receive the wedding garment from the host, which is God. What is the tradition? What does this mean about the wedding garment? When people went to a wedding in that beautiful ancient Eastern culture, they, would, they wanted everyone to be as pristine, as beautiful as possible, and to rejoice in how they were, and no one in any way to feel ashamed of themselves. So as Adam and Eve were clothed with grace in the Garden of Eden, and were naked and not ashamed because they were clothed with grace, the host would give each person a beautiful white linen wedding garment so that you can imagine that not only is the bride white, but the whole party is white. All of us are white and beautiful and full of light as we're celebrating the wedding. And the person without the wedding garment didn't want to put it on. That's the understanding that he, that Jesus, the host, is saying, here I am, let me clothe you with me because you need me. Isn't that a nice white jacket, by the way? <laughs> bravo, bravo. So, you need me. But if we say, we go through life and we say, I don't need you, God, then you're not putting on the wedding garment. If we go through life and think that we have to do it alone, then you're not doing it like an orthodox wedding with the wedding garment and the support of God, family, friends, church. We all need to put on the wedding garment. And St. Gregory's dialogist says, as we are all here bad and good, we support each other and no one is allowed to judge the other. And the one with the wedding garment who is not willing to put on grace, forgiveness, understanding, and repentance, is cast out because he's not supporting. St. Gregory the Diologist. Do you get it? He's not joining. Why do we come to the cup? Because I need his body and I need his blood and you need his body and his blood. You need his life and you need his forgiveness and you need to be made new again and you need to start over with a white garment washed clean, as it says in Revelation, by the blood of the Lamb. Let me give you some beautiful quotes, okay? And so it just give you some things to think about and read. All right. 
So even in your Orthodox study Bible, let me say, the wedding garments would have been provided by the king. This is the footnotes of your Orthodox study Bibles. And therefore the man had no excuse for not wearing one because the king would have given it to him as he came in. But he is speechless, as it says in the Gospel, because his refusal to wear the garment that was provided is an illustration of those who refuse God's hospitality or who want his kingdom on their own terms. Wow. Specifically, the garment refers to the baptismal garment and by extension, a life of faith, repentance, virtue, and charity. Without these, a person will ultimately be cast out into the outer darkness. Saint Athanasios, that's the other saint. <laughs> saint Athanasios said he went right into 1 Corinthians 13, the garment at the end of the day is love. Does Christ find love in our hearts for one another? And he went into 1 Corinthians 13. The wedding garment is provided by the host. He is giving it to you, and he is asking that first and foremost, you marry him so that you could understand. The intimacy of love, the love God has for us, is hard to comprehend. The only comparison comes by this analogy especially with the wedding banquet. It is the closest one. The oneness that we want with the spouse, our tender love and desire for our children. And yet, there is an intimacy that I want you to think about that we seek with each other that always eludes us. Even if you have the most amazing spouse, even if you have the most beautiful children and everything is great, there is something that is still eluding us. We can never be as close and as intimate or as one with another person as our souls crave unless we're married to God. That's because the oneness that we crave will only be found when we are united by God with God. And God likens it to his own marriage. Revelations 19, 7 through 9. The time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself, us. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19. And again in John he says, The Lord says to the Father as he's praying, I am praying for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, Father, as you are in me and I am in you. May they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Can you believe he says that before he's going to die? That he, before Christ goes to die for us, he says, Father, I want them to know that you love them as much as you love me. That he loves you and me as much as he loves his beloved son, Jesus Christ. It's in the Gospel of John. That he loves, and you, I, I'm, you know, for me this is everything. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. In heaven. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. This is the intimacy. And Isaiah 25. On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. He will destroy that thing that keeps us from understanding how to love one another, how to understand who we really are, who and, and everything that's in the clouds, everything that's in a veil, that sheet that covers all nations and divides them. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord 
will wipe away the tears from all the faces and he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. He will remove the people's disgrace from all the earth. Today, let's put on the wedding garment, reaffirm our baptism. When we go out with the great entrance and the deacon and I say, may the Lord remember all of you in his kingdom, <laughs> 